Hello. Hello all. So today we're joined by Lorraine Finch and Gavin Starks. Uh, and we shall uh, the talk today. I'll, I'll let them introduce themselves uh, and talk about more about their talk. But something very exciting today to talk about a uh, project they're working on with design. So it should be very, very interesting. Shall I? Shall I hand it over? To me. Hand it over. Hand it over. Hand I oh, hand over to you. <laughs> oh, yeah, introduction. Yeah, no, go for it, uh, Gavin and Lorraine. I thought you, you were going to ask the questions. You can, but okay, first you can introductions. <laughs> no, no, go for it. <laughs> I'll hand over to Gavin. Oh, uh, well, uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening, good morning, etc. depending on what time zone you're in. Uh, my name is Gavin Starks. Uh, I've been doing uh, web based development for coming on for 25 years now. Um, and have lots of uh, lots of stories to share. Um, my background includes a whole range of different things, but uh, of most significance is, is probably helping to set up and run the Open Data Institute in uh, the UK for four years, and then co-chairing the development of a thing called the Open Banking Standard, which is mandated data interoperability across the banking sector, and currently working on a range of projects uh, across the energy sector, finance, and so on, about data exchange. And uh, today we're going to talk about none of those. So I'll pass <laughs> over to Lorraine. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Lorraine. I'm an accredited conservator. Um, I've worked in conservation now for 27 years, and I trained at Camberwell College of Arts. Um, I run my own business. Um, I've been doing that for the last 18 years and I provide um, consultancy around environmental sustainability and preservation and I'm working with Gavin on the exciting project with DCD. Excellent. Um, feel free to advertise as well. That's absolutely fine. We're, we're, we're open to you. Uh, cool. Corporate sponsorship and plugs and whatever you, whatever you do, just feel free to advertise whatever you're doing. Um, so, Gavin, uh, you'll be presenting today. Shall we? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, Annalise, did you want to start with some? You said you had some questions or something to. Keep well, I thought that Bob was going to ask the questions, but I can do them if. <laughs> oh, oh, we can ask questions if you want. Uh, uh, but I can do them. I just need to find the files with the questions that I... Do you have them in front of you uh, above? Mm, no. no. Okay, I, have... I, I, I can kick it off. Um, do, Gavin, uh, coding. Uh, <laughs> how did you get into coding? This is... <laughs> yeah. So that, that goes back into the, the, the mists of time. Um, I had a family member brought over a BBC Micro when they were very, when they were just launched. So I, I wrote, I think I wrote my first line of code when I was about eight and um, then bought myself a ZX Spectrum in the eighties and taught myself how to code. Uh, the really useful thing about the Spectrum was it had all the commands on the keys. You just press the key and it gave you the, the code word. So you didn't have, a, you didn't need a manual. It's fantastic. You just keep pushing buttons until things happened, which when you're 13 is something you've got the patience to do. Um, and then got slightly more serious when I was, um, I studied astrophysics and we were doing uh, computational modeling of um, black holes and things like that. So that got a bit more interesting. I think I started on Amiga 500. <laughs> that was my, and Commodore 64. <laughs> And and Elise, uh, did you? It's me. Okay, so um, I'm I'm not muted. Great. Uh, so uh, how how yeah? The, how is coding part of your job, Gavin? But I think you're ready. I uh, yeah, no, your current job. How is coding part of your job, or how does it enhance your work? Well, um, I, I I try to avoid coding as much as possible at the moment because I've got people who can actually who actually know how to do it better than I do uh, doing the work. But the organisation, uh, or two organisations I'm running at the moment, uh, one uh, is working on um, data exchange and data sharing. Uh, and so there's people building search engines and um, 
trust frameworks and APIs and things like that. Uh, I tend to fiddle around still with a bit of PHP and a bit of shell script. That's about as advanced as I get these days um, to make things happen faster uh, when um, I, need, I, do, I want to get something done. Isn't that all of our, I mean, that's a purpose for everybody, I think. And what do you think from your point of view um, could coding mean for the cultural heritage sector that you've been? Sure, well, I'm going to touch on uh, a lot of this. I think for me, it's it's about making sure that we can build systems that last and meet the needs of users. So today I'll, I'll be covering, I'm going to be talking more about user needs than I'm going to be talking about code. Okay, great. Thanks. And, and, and the top of your talk is today is... Um, Digital archives are done by analog thinking. What what do you mean by analog thinking? What's your... right, well, I can I can kick off on the on the presentation if you want, and we can we can go through that. Yeah. Uh, do you want to? Uh, I wasn't yeah, sure yeah. if you had some uh, questions for Lorraine as well in the mix. Of, uh, yeah, L Lorraine, questions. same questions go for you actually. So let's let me just like kind of do the, the small summary. How did you get into coding if you actively use code, which I actually don't know if you do it that much, but, and then how can, do you think that coding can enhance the cultural, thinking in the cultural heritage sector? Um, how, how do you feel about that? So I was at school when computers started to come in and was very interested in learning to code when I was at school. Because I was a girl, I was asked to leave the class. And so it's something that I've been learning in my own time. And over the last few years, I've been using the online resources and learned a little bit of coding. But it's not something that I actively use in my day-to-day -day, um, work in terms of me coding. I benefit from other people doing the coding. Um, in terms of the benefits to the cultural heritage sector, the, one of the things that with DCD project is the use of the AI and the advantages that really brings to cultural heritage. So for example, there was recently an advertisement for volunteers to, to take a collection of manuscripts which were going to be digitized. The digitized images were then going to go to the volunteers who were going to transcribe the manuscripts. And those digital, those transcriptions that the volunteers did were then going to be added to the database to be uploaded to the web. AI can transcribe that, don't need the volunteers. It would save huge amounts of work. And then you get the volunteers in to actually put right any of the errors that the AI has caused. However, I do find that there's such resistance within the cultural heritage sector to using AI. It's really interesting the pushback that you get when you mention it. I, I, Interesting. I, Who do you get it from? That's, that's what I'd like. <laughs> from <laughs> other conservators, from say, archivists, okay. from curators. So okay. anybody who's working within the profession, I think partly because we have a very traditional outlook. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know why they're doing it because I don't share that mindset. Yeah, I, I, I think I agree, Lorraine. I hear a lot of people and sometimes it's even including myself <laughs> resisting a bit against AI. Not entirely. Uh, I just, I feel you have to know where you can use it. But that's my, yeah, for if you use it well, it can be a very mm -hmm. fruitful. I agree. And we've only scratched the surface. We've, we literally sort of stared at it and that's about it. It's so much that it can offer. Can I ask something? Oh, go ahead, Bob. Sorry, no, I was going to ask the opposite. Like, where do you find you get support? Like, who are supporting it? Who's, who's mm. quite positive about it? <clears throat> I don't know. I have to say at the moment, what I've seen is, is mostly <laughs> pushback. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that that's, that, that, that's uh, let me run through. I've, I've got a few slides to run through and we'll touch up bring out some of these uh, points as we go yeah. along and then yeah. we can unpack them a bit more in uh, in the mix. I think that largely though there's just fear of the unknown is, is my starting point mm -hmm. uh, and, and fear of being commoditized out of the way you know. 
what am I going to do if, if the machines do everything? Um, mm. but shall, shall I kick off now or do you want to? Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to ask everybody uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, write it in the chat. If you want to remember, feel free to uh, ask them yourself after the presentation. If there's something um, that is very particular for one slide, Gavin, I might, and, and there's a question that pops up in the chat, I might stop you and just ask a question about that slide, but that's it. <laughs> Super. Well, uh, I shall kick off then. So hopefully, uh, let me just get my windows in order here. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yep. And yeah, as I'm going through this, just um, feel free to uh, just drop questions into the into the chat. Um, so I'm going to cover here a project we've been working on uh, with a tiny, uh, like three people, four people uh, collection in uh, Canada uh, called DCD. It's a digital uh, collection of Canadian dance. Uh, and they've got, they're effectively the custodians for Canadian dance history. And we worked with them for quite a while just to really go on this journey. And, and I think they're a great example because when they started, they, they've obviously had a website and knew that they could probably do things differently or do things better, but they've got no time and no resources and uh, don't have the skills in-house to, to build those kind of things. Uh, and so they asked uh, if, if we could just help them think it through. So we spent a good amount of time working with them and they managed to get some some grant funding to to help uh, fund the development work to just work through what is the thing that they actually need um and so we started off actually with a report but that report was based on lots of interviews and consultation and analysis of what people were actually doing and what they were uh, using and, and also working with the dcd team themselves um to ask them what they wanted rather than what they thought they should have or what they, you know, what do they actually need versus what they think they need. Uh, and that is a much bigger question. And so that before we wrote a line of code, we spent a lot of time just talking to see what's achievable and what's useful and what's sustainable uh, in the mix. Oops. And here with uh, the collection, they've got photographs, uh, they've got artifacts like um, costumes, uh, they've got programs, they've got old printed magazines, they've got uh, some digital assets, they've got a da database of things, they've got ticket stubs, there's a whole range of different things as you find in all collections, they're just a random collection of stuff in boxes uh, in a lot of cases. And you have to kind of work through all of that. And, and our question was why, you know, what's their um, what, what do they want to achieve as an organization? So it's not something where we thought, well, you could put a database on, on the internet. Yippee, what does that mean? Who cares? Why, why? And so on. But what do they actually want to do? Well, they want to inspire people through the collection and really help to foster appreciation of dance uh, and how, what it, uh, role it plays in our lives. And their role as a collection is to collect and preserve and exhibit things. It's not just an archiving process where we've got a big warehouse and we're very good at putting things in boxes and putting them in a cupboard. Uh, it's, we'd want to do something with it. You know, there's a, a lot of questions in here as to artifacts as like, well, if they're just, if nobody's using them, why are we keeping them? Uh, lots of really difficult questions in there, which I'm not going to begin to un unpack because that's Lorraine, more Lorraine's domain as well. Um, but here we want to create a digital version of their collection that met the needs of both the organization so how do they archive things and how do they put them into a digital representation of that archive and its users, which is how, who are the users and what do they want to do with this stuff? Uh, and I think there's, when just to touch on the sort of um, the title that was mentioned there on uh, sort of legacy thinking or, or uh, thinking that's aligned with the structure of organizations. When people come to build a website, they tend to mirror their organizational structure. So they think of a website a bit like a building that's got a front door that you kind of go into and it's got different rooms and there's a box in the room. And 
they are in control of what's in the rooms and they're in control of the door and they're in that. And we all know f from our experiences that isn't the way the web works at all. The web works by somebody sending you something on Twitter or on WhatsApp and you clicking deep into a, a deep link on a website or they send you the image directly or you're on Instagram and someone posts the thing and it's just messy. It's really messy. Uh, and it's um, curated. Well, it's not curated. It's curated by the user in that particular moment. Uh, and it's quite random. Uh, and so there's a, a lot of principles there that are not the way that organizations think. And you can go to a lot of uh, cultural institutions and the websites kind of look like the organizational hierarchy that exists inside the organization. Uh, and that's what it's not what users are interested in. They're like, can you sh get me, show me the thing uh, quickly? So the responsibilities though are of, a, of an organization like that are to preserve the archives themselves and document and provide access and serve communities. And there's a lot of emphasis on the first two of those and not so much emphasize, uh, emphasis on the second two. So we, we came at this from the other end, you know, who are the communities we want to serve and what do they do? And, and we found this, you know, did this brilliant bit of um, analysis here, one of the team looking at the arts organizations and nonprofit organizations in Canada that had received government funding and how many of them um, had, had, had public funding for their um, website development and how many of them are actually still up to date. So there's a general pattern here, and this is, again, it's very analog thinking. People are used to, and governments particularly, are used to saying, oh, well, we need a thing, let's build a building, and then we'll put some people in the building and they'll work it out. And that thinking is applied to websites. Oh, we'll build a website, and then the website shall be built, and then things will happen. But once we've built the website, it's finished. And as again, as we know from the web, and as we know from coding, it's never finished. It's never, uh, uh, there's, there's not an end point to this development. It's a continuous process. And the way that things get funded tend to be, oh, we'll give you a grant for three months or six months or a year, and you'll build a thing and then it'll be finished. Uh, and so what th these, um, this analysis says was actually, there's millions invested in um, the creation of these things. But when the developer walks away from them, because quite often, as with DCD, they don't have an in-house development team and they never will do. So as soon as the developer or the agency or the organization or the individual who's been brought in to build a thing fit, is gone, the website isn't touched. Uh, and I think understanding why involves everything from code to culture. So there's a, is it usable is an obvious one. But are the users, as in the, the organizational users, thinking digital first or analog first? And our experience, I think, is that everybody's thinking analog first. They're thinking, we've got objects, we can put them in a room, we can get people into the room, and that's what we do, or, and we've got a website. Instead of, our approach has been, you've got all these amazing assets, where are the users? Let's take them all to where the users are and think digital first because you can reach more people digitally than you can in person. And certainly over the last year, as the world shut down, there were no, well, there's no footfall. So that's actually helped to drive forward, I think, a lot of the thinking and the cultural changes that are needed. But when you look at the complexity of this, and this is where people get really um, kind of bogged down, I think, as well, is what are the objectives here? They've got to collect and preserve and safeguard things. They've got to make sure that things are available to present and future generations. They've got to ensure accessibility to everyone. And this is these are remits before we mention the word digital or code or anything to do with the web. But here, um, these are the kind of, I'm not going to read them all out, um, but the process here of really trying to connect people with each other around the collection around the things that is the common history here and, and changing the way that we even talk about what is a collection. Well, he, how are we going to build on our shared history and how do we contribute to that shared history as a living history that, that moves us into the future? Uh, and so we had questions like, um, well, if the current generation of dancers are um, 
taking videos of themselves on their phones and uploading them to uh, Instagram, how do we get them into the collection? Because it only exists over there. You can't download it from uh, Instagram. I'm not sure you, if you even should. There's loads of privacy issues, loads of technical issues and so on. But at least we should be able to point at them and say, well, well even before that, ask the question, is that part of our cultural history? Are the digital assets that we're all producing around all of our collections part of our cultural history? My view would be, yes, of course they are. Are we treating them as such? Not really. Um, and are we going to rely on the Internet Archive to take them all for us? No. So with all of that, how do we keep it simple? How do we make it really simple for, for the user? And here, what we've built on the DCD uh, website, and I'll share the address in, in a moment, um, is how do you create something? Uh, and so the previous system, and this is, again, um, born out of many years of experience. The previous system that we're using had lots of metadata fields. Uh, it was like, what's the X of Y? What's the date of Z? And what's the language? And some fields were had a kind of ontology around them. And, and I think my experience is, if, as soon as you start talking about what data should we be collecting, you've kind of lost. <laughs> um, our approach here was give it a name, give it a description if you can, add the media, and that's it. Now, we'll also allow lots of other tagging and stuff like that. So think tags rather than metadata fields that thou shalt fill in. Um, when you're trying to do something at scale, most of the data either doesn't exist or people are too bored or don't have the insights to have get hold of the information. Um, so you can't make too many things mandatory. And, and just the conversation about what field should be mandatory it went on for months uh, with, with DCD as to what was important to them. And they kept thinking through, oh, well, so-and-so might need it for this and so-and-so might need it for that. But our direction here is to say, what's the minimum viable thing that everybody can do? You know, what is it? What, what do you think it is? <laughs> the starting point. Um, and then allow others to edit this item, which is the button on this uh, screen that is, is, an, is the important one, is if you don't know, maybe somebody else does. Uh, and that's the kind of principles of Wikipedia and the, the collaborative web, is just put the thing out there and see if anybody else cares. Uh, and if they do, they'll help you get there. And out of that, we've uh, then got the, the search function, which has got the images. You can see the tags uh, up there. So it's kind of a an Instagram or Pinterest type of, I know, an Instagram kind of um, uh, layout, uh, which we're still iterating on. It's very uh, early days, but we're just trying to say, like, let's show lots of images. Don't present people with 100 search box options for what they can find. Just show them stuff and let them search. So designing for search is our, one of our guiding principles. There's other things like tag clouds and collections and things like that, but design for search. And then when you drill into a specific item that's been uploaded, you can see on the left-hand side here, there's the original image. There's the file name of the original image, because in the absence of other metadata, uh, you're really reliant on the file name to, to tell you what's in it, because that's the only place people have got to type things. Um, and then we've run it through a bunch of AI, and I've run it through both the Google and the Microsoft AI uh, systems here. So what we've done here is we've got a text description, which somebody's added, and then we've got an auto description, and then we've got tags, and we've got auto tags. Um, now, there's a really important distinction here, and I've pulled these out to, to illustrate. We need to make very clear when these things are machine generated and when they're human generated. Because machines are still not great at understanding when something is inappropriate. You know, so if you upload images and there's plenty of examples around the web of AI miscategorizing uh, different races inappropriately. Uh, and we need to be very clear so as to both not offend people, um, but also to be more accurate, that we dis distinguish between what is machine generated and what isn't. And there's liability questions in there as well. So here the auto description is a person in a dark room. 
that's pretty pretty damn good actually. And then the tags, the uh, auto tags have been person, clothing, dancer, sports, photo, human face, and night. So we're starting to get really interesting uh, information here. Now, DCD are a tiny team. They have hundreds of thousands of images. They're not going to get through their own collection in their own lifetimes if they do it manually. So the advantage of using a, an AI um, or... Uh, Basically, I, I won't even call it AI. I'll say just machines to work things out for us is that we can start to create a first pass of categorization to enable things to be discovered that humans can then improve on and use. And so it's that way around. So when we talk about what's the organizational need there is, can we just automatically classify everything? And we've done this uh, for sounds where it... Um, indexes the sound, it does um, speech to text, makes the text searchable. We've done it with uh, scanned uh, um, magazines, for example, where it will scan the text and turn it into um, the uh, written uh, text or extracted text from the, from the image. And, and this example, you can see that the extracted text uh, is actually not bad given the handwriting <laughs> in this instance. Um, it's pretty good and searchable. So it's got the address right. You know, um, hasn't got um, the name of the person right quite, uh, but it's, it's near. Um, and the auto tags are pretty damn good. You know? So again, as, as from, a, from a discoverability point of view, we're solving, I think, the first order problem is like, can we get a lot of stuff and make it more discoverable? Uh, and that's kind of initial uh, user need. And then there's an actual uh, description here, which adds data that isn't in the asset at all. Uh, it says it's Christmas card sent to Alison Sutcliffe. So all of this is... Um, documented on the website, uh, the, the development website, we called it DCD Labs. Again, a, a little uh, psychological hack is whatever you want to do that feels from an organizational point of view risky, and every organization, as Lorraine was saying, is terrified by all of this, call it Labs. Uh, it, it's, it's just a really neat hack. Everybody goes, okay, we're just in a laboratory we're making things up. They might catch fire. They might not. We'll put them out. Uh, and we actually, on the website itself, we say this website may or may not exist from day to day because we're working on it. So we can reinforce that. Um, and then we've also, uh, we, we, whenever we update uh, the website, the website's WordPress. Um, and underneath that, the there's a whole tech stack there with, of PHP. And then there's a development framework of Laravel um, and a bunch of things there which I have no idea what half of them are now um, and a bunch of libraries and then we use uh, Azure and, and, the, and the Google uh, Vision AI. The search itself is Al uh, Algolia and the website is WordPress. So the tech stack there, what we've tried to do, the guiding principle throughout all of this and by the time we get to the end of this development phase, we want to wrap all of this up in an open source box so that anyone can implement it because Back to that earlier point, one is it has to be usable by the customer or the user or the institution. And one of the ways to protect that is to make the whole thing open enough that somebody else can come into it and do the same thing again. If there's more than one of you developing the same underlying tech stack, then you increase the resilience and the sustainability of the whole thing. And that's you know baked into the founding principles of, of um, free software and the open web is if given that there are thousands of tiny organizations that are getting funding to build things, what if we all develop the same tech stack for the particular applications? Because the problems we're addressing with DCD are not unique in any way. Um, so I just want to finish off with lots of questions here. You know, what's an archive in the digital age? How do we embrace digital first? What, what are the user's needs? Who knows? Um, and how does it fit within a bigger ecosystem? 
what challenges exist? Digitization is one. Licensing is a big one. We obviously recommend open by default, uh, but that can't be applied to everything. But we can put things up there with a copyright symbol on, on them and some terms and conditions. And that's good enough, actually, for a lot of things. Um, and then how do we make it sustainable? So I've got three core principles just to finish off with. One, design for search. Everything you, every line of code you write that involves some form of data, and we're all dealing with data, uh, that's what we're all shipping around. Design it with search in mind. Another principle here is connect, don't collect. Don't imagine that we have to put everything into one place in, in order to be the master thing. Much better if we are uh, many parts loosely joined. So can we link out to everybody else rather than making a copy of everybody else's things? Uh, and that's very much, you know, when you look at the homepage of any news service now, it's not something that somebody has made. It's a combination of 50 different things that change once a minute from a 50 different places. Um, so APIs uh, and interoperability is absolutely critical. And then thirdly, and most obviously, focus on user needs. If the user doesn't need it, don't build it. You know, uh, we, it's very uh, enticing and, and we go down the rabbit hole. Of, Wouldn't it be great if we could do this? Now, we have done a bit of that with the AI, but we couldn't go out with a, would you like to use AI to the user? Because <laughs> they, they just stare blankly and say, I don't know what that means. Show me the thing. So you've got to get it to a point where you show the thing and say, is this useful? And then people go, ah, oh, great. How does it work? And you can try and explain it, but nobody cares. So the user needs here are absolutely central to this, but you've also got to do your minimum viable thing. And we do this on a week to week basis. You know, the developers here, you know, we added a, a PDF, turn PDF text into actually searchable text. Uh, and they were, the developers were worried, well, you know, where do we put it? So just put it in a big text box on, uh, on the page. And well, that's going to be really messy. I, was like, I don't care. It makes it searchable. So that was our MVP. It's just put the thing on the website. Great. It's done. So I'm going to stop there and uh, we can go to questions. So lots of questions there in the chat. There were a few questions in the chat, but I'll, uh, the two were mine. <laughs> the first one was <laughs> Melissa's. So I'm going to let her ask her uh, question first. <laughs> well, when you were showing the entries um, and you, you had the, the text, I'm sorry, they're doing construction outside my house if it's loud. Uh, I was just wondering, I was just thinking about accessibility and alt text. And I was wondering if that kind of alt text, if you include it, would it if it would be separate from the other entry um, that you were showing. And I guess kind of one other tag on question to that is thinking about SEO and how all of this text is going to help these other websites um, perform. Yeah, they're all great questions. At the moment, we haven't done anything with alt text. Um, I think the, the default should be probably we put the title in the alt text but I, I think there's a there's a whole set of usability things in this which um we were just at the beginning of uh, my preference in all of these things is to try and make the whole thing uh contain fewer features from a user's point of view rather than more and um it's actually quite a good development principle uh once you've built whatever it is to gradually remove features until people start complaining <laughs> uh, then you actually work out what what are they actually doing um but i think the the usability element of this is one area where organizations really struggle um because a they, they're worried about legislation because they're legally especially with public funding legally required uh, to make things accessible but then get stuck almost immediately so um because again, it, it skills, time, energy, et cetera. So we want to try and work out how to make them default things that get incorporated into the basic build. Uh, but uh, alt text is, is one of those things, I think. Um, and, and certainly with the auto generation of tags and descriptions, if there's no other data, let's put some of the auto descriptions or auto tags into the alts and, and that is better than nothing. And if they're wrong, <laughs> doesn't matter it's a classic thing of like don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good at the moment we have nothing <laughs> greater than zero is infinity better so um 
But thanks, th thanks, Gavin. I, I really loved your last slide, by the way. I was thinking the, the three little points, especially number one and two, and I can't really reproduce them right now, but- um, Design for it, search, connect, don't collect. Connect, Basically. connect, don't collect. I definitely think this was the best Usually. one yeah. From, yeah. from like a, a, a collections institution, from like a museum perspective. That's a really wise, wise lesson. We should learn more. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've blogged about that with a, a different hat on, but uh, it's, it's equally applicable, I think, to, to everything. Um, I was wondering if you have an opinion on, yeah, so again, from a, from a collections perspective, it's really great to have big collections that are very democratic and kind of, where you see everything the world has to offer, not only the most exclusive pre-selected things, right? But it's true that it also means quite a lot of maintenance over time, which is a digital archive can seem quite easy in the beginning, but over time it also becomes like, it can, be, it can become really big and it can be quite an effort uh, in, in time and, and also money to mm -hmm. actually maintain it. And I wonder what your, just like your view about that is. Yeah, well, I think like, the, the, there's a kind of hierarchy almost of needs uh, where as a collection, you could say, well, what's the most important thing that we could put online? It's not actually the collection. It's the description of the collection in a machine readable form so that people can find it if search engines can find it and then land somewhere near you or near enough that they can get in touch that's again it's greater than zero which is currently where most things are um, so publishing machine readable open data of the contents of a collection uh, is my kind of number one ask actually is make everything search because that makes everything searchable um, and, and that means you've got to get the data right in, in the first place, right? So that's where actually it comes back to, well, if we can also tag everything, publish a big list and you can publish it as a CSV file, you know, yeah. you don't need, you know, vast quantities of, of tech in order to, to solve most of these first order challenges. Uh, what we've glued together here, and it's very much look at what's out there find out which is the most open thing that exists, glue it together with the other things. That means that there's more likelihoods and picking things that are, are popular as well, like PHP, uh, rather than whatever, I don't even know what the current flavor of the month is in tech, uh, uh, in coding. But, um, you know, it waxes and wanes. So picking something that's been around for a long time, it means there's more people who can do it, which is, means it's more likely you'll find somebody wherever you know find them on fiverr you know, probably a whole team of people in some country that we're not currently talking to that could solve a problem as long as they're they're, they're working to the right principles so there's a set of guiding principles here as well and then that sustainability thing yeah i'd love it if if funders were able to do a smaller amount of funding for a longer period of time yeah, uh, that that's really it's the longevity that's the important thing, and it's taken us several years of development with DCD, and it's it's ongoing to arrive at what we all think is the minimum viable offering for for their users in a way that they can manage. It's all very well us being around and saying, "Oh, well, we can do this in X, Y, Z." But when we step away from that project, they have to be able to keep the wheels on and, and know where to put the petrol in and all what my other terrible analogies. But uh, the um, that's where I think it makes much more sense for people to club together as a development community and say, what projects would we like to cluster around and push forward as an open source project? Uh, and there's plenty of successful examples of that, things like Debian, uh, where there's a, a rich open community and it's persisted. The thing about those communities, once they reach a certain size, they keep going. Even yeah. if the, even if the core gets decimated every four years by some big multinational hiring everybody, it, they persist. Uh, yeah. And I think the cultural community, the, the development community, if we 
find a way of coordinating that with groups like yourselves, the sum would be much greater. Uh, so the whole would be much greater than some of its parts. Yeah. Thanks for that. It's it's great. Uh, Scott uh, also asked a question. Um, Scott, I can read it for you, but you can also ask it yourself if you mm -hmm. want. Yeah, um, apparently uh, quite good. Um, so uh, I think as long as the words are roughly the right words, uh, whether it's dance terminology or dance form or something, then it's searchable. And the, the only problem we're trying to solve with the automatic tagging of things is the ability for somebody to find it. So if they search for a name and it's bringing up a whole bunch of different things, um, then that's still better than nothing. So uh, we'll just so, say what the what the question was, just because it's yeah. a recording. Yeah, sorry, I was I was talking to uh, oh. Scott, <laughs> thinking he would unmute himself. But um, so, how machine readable is free text? I guess I'm thinking about potential ambiguity. Uh, for example, an artist's name also being dance terminology or a dance form. So that that's what Gavin is responding to right now. Mm. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll just paste a, a link in here to the one of the I've just searched very quickly for text on the thing. So there's a a, a, a printout that has been scanned, which looks like it's been typed on an old typewriter. Um, the in, auto tagging has got it as text, uh, black and white photograph. Um, the extracted text from it is is pretty spot on, uh, and it's the whole chunk is in there. Um, so that that seems to be fit for purpose from from my point of view. Um, Scott, does that answer your question? <laughs> oh, okay. He says, <laughs> he says yes, but you can't join by audio. And, and I have a question as well. What I, I am not a native English speaker, so my language is French, which is kind of okay usually, but then we go to Dutch, which is kind of harder. I do feel like we, if we go to auto reading, it's not only a machine translating a letter to another letter uh, that, is, uh, that is input, that has a digital input. Um, it really thinks a lot, this machine, but then if it has to translate a Dutch text, it often <laughs> totally gets lost <laughs> and doesn't know what to do with it anymore. Yeah, well, the, the uh, various systems now have multilingual uh, uh, capabilities. Um, so I would certainly hope that, um, again, there'll be variable results. But all we're trying to do here is say, is the thing that we've, we're building here better than what the way we're doing at the moment? Uh, mm -hmm. It just needs to be better. Uh, I've got a question <laughs> uh, for Lorraine. Um, how how was your experience with this? Like you said, you mentioned like coding wasn't necessarily your background, but how did you like? How did you? How was your experience with it? <laughs> so we have two developers who are developing DCD Discover. Um, and so the questions get passed over to those. <clears throat> but in terms of using the site, I find the site incredibly easy to use. And you find the results. There are still a few glitches with it, but you know it's a work in process. And as Gavin said, nothing is ever finished. So there will always be things that we can do and add on to it. One of the things that I'm finding, because I'm working as the community manager um, for DCD for the project. So bringing the users on board to get the user feedback for the site is sometimes um, the difference between the text speak and the archivist speak. And sometimes I feel like I'm an interpreter. I think, I, I think, I think working in a museum, you do feel like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone comes in from their own specialisms and you just feel like it's like you're talking <laughs> in, 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 in different languages most of the time anyway, I find. <laughs> so one of the really and still ongoing conversations we're having is use of the word collection and collections. I can't tell you how many hours we've spent on that. <laughs> like, <laughs> do you mean like, like, like glossary type? Like well, what is a collection? How do you define a collection in oh, the physical yeah, yeah. world? How is a collection defined in DCD Discover? How do we split collections? It's DCD collection, but then within that there are sub-collections such as the Maud Allen collection, 
the yeah. Lewis Smith collection, how are the users going to use that word? <laughs> how are they going to use that word to find what they want to find? Again, at the end of the day, it's about making it easy and accessible to use. So that's where the conversation has come around collections is how do we use that term or do we not use the term at all and make the collections easy to find, the information easy to find? Yeah, I, I think that's a common theme, right? You can count how you count collections and all the, um, I think we, I think even like the v &A fluctuates between like 3 million or 10 million, you just get a different stat every other week, <laughs> you know, <laughs> depending how you want to count. <laughs> Melissa? Uh, I have a question. Yeah. So I love that you're making this open source and I imagine there's going to be a lot of power in having multiple places set up this capabilities. Um, you know, maybe there could be one giant database. I don't know if that's what you're thinking. I'm, I'm wondering if you can kind of expand about uh, on that and also kind of share your plans for how you're going to make this available to people, how you want to get the word out. Um, sure. Well, this, we're doing it right now so please please get involved tell other people to get involved um we're, we're trying to work it out uh, i think the what i think is the opportunity here is we, we've got to a point now where the tech is uh, very broadly accessible and the costs of things like storage are, are tiny really in the, in the scheme of things you know we, we can put up hundreds of thousands of images into cloud storage for not quite pennies, but not 20 million pounds, which is what it used to cost. Um, so I think the, the the principles here that we'd, I'd love to see developed on the back of what we're, we're trying to put together is how do we build this into more of a federated system? So like if all of the different, if we had a common instance or instances that can be forked off into different implementations that there's a main maintenance of some inter interoperability between them so you can start searching and between collections and joining them up um, wouldn't it be great to have a cultural sector search box which just went to every single cultural institution and searched them rather than google searching the entire web you know is there a curated bunch of people who say actually we want want to do this together and search across institutions uh, and it's the kind of thing that the Europa project and things like that have been trying to do um, to varying degrees of success. But I think that there's a a lot of historical projects have taken quite a top down approach rather than a bottom up approach. And I think there's there's need for both approaches and there's not been enough bottom up type work. So we're trying to just get some of the Lego pieces and sit here and say, well, what if we all had copies of all of our metadata in all of our archives? I mean, that, that'd be a really good resilience thing as arts funding, uh, arts funding gets cut uh, or it, organizations just disappear, you know, they blink out uh, of existence. Uh, and again, a lot of institutions you know, um, are tiny. So they're, they're extremely high risk from a cultural perspective. Um, so, and, and things like, you know, I'd encourage people to look at archive.org and, and how they do things to try and make sure we've got some form of record of what our digital heritage is because it's it's passing us by and we're not even sure whether we should be collecting it or which bits to collect or what it even means and, and to Lorraine's point on what is a collection well if someone's tweeted about Maud Allen uh, who's one of the dancers in the in the DCD collection should should we put that in the dcd thing or does it sit over there or how do we link to it what does that even mean and obviously that do we where do we draw the line where is there a boundary condition uh, if someone said something really material uh does someone from dcd have to go and cu curate it and actively put it into the formal collection of dcd mm -hmm. versus user generated content these are all crazy questions right but um that's kind of the, the, the journey that um, we'll only solve as a community. Yeah, I, I often, I wonder this often. Um, you, you have users and I sometimes feel 
you have the broad democratic spectrum of what is everybody's opinion about one specific art piece, for example. But still, when people come in the museum, often they want to see somebody else's curated opinion about that thing. That's actually why they come. <laughs> they think, like, what? I have to give my opinion? No. It's not what I came from. <laughs> came for, I pay. <laughs> So you could tell me what I need to think. It's it's really weird, and it's a it's a really a balance that you have to uh, kind of find. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, sorry. No, 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 I, was, I was thinking, like like you said, like it's a discussion we're having right now about digital born object. Like, um, uh, for example, the computer games. Do we actually want to preserve the computer game, or do we want to preserve the people's experience of it? Like, so there's a lot of people playing computer games on YouTube and you know it's the social side of it and like talking about what they're doing and curating it and is that what we want to preserve about the computer game or is it the actual computer game itself because you can't you know if you go to a museum you can't really just sit there playing a computer game but you can yeah or, or is it the code in the native language on the original machine you know like the, yeah, and all the, yeah to, and all to, to questions, please, yeah. um first web server on a next cube sits in the science museum now and that's an artifact i mean you could switch it on and, and, and run it um what are your thoughts about the data that you're going to get out of people using the database like how people are interacting it do you have any thoughts about how that could yeah so we, we, we've taken quite a, i think a hopefully a good stance here of we don't collect any user data unless they register and put something in because if they if there's going to be user generated content here they need to be able to log in and edit it right uh, and there's a separation that uh, the, the instant someone does that there's a separation of liability as well of like it's not dcd being liable for something that one of the users said um but equally um you know we, we haven't integrated any form of um advertising or anything like that into the site which we've seen on other cultural sites uh, so we're not part of the sort of uh, uh, capitalist kind of uh, or sort of surveillance capitalism sort of infrastructure industrial complex kind of uh, thing which I think is quite important in the mix um, so I think there's a data minimization piece and equally for European institutions everybody's terrified of GDPR because nobody quite knows what it means and Therefore, if we don't know what it means, let's not do it. You know, any excuse to not do something. Um, but just, um, I think there's a process here of saying, what would be useful? So one of the things I think would be useful, but we haven't built it yet, is to put back on the website what people are searching for. Mm. So that DCD can go, oh, people are searching for that thing, because nobody looks at web logs. Unless they unless they pay somebody in a commercial organisation to, but I doubt very very much whether any cultural institution looks too much at those web web logs to find out what they what's actually going on, and the, the the larger ones can afford to buy the tools that allow them to do that and have a website um, manager who who looks at that, but just from a really raw perspective, a small organisation um, being able to see what people are searching for would help them prioritize what they digitize mm -hmm. or what they run a feature on and making that a bit visible to everybody else is also a good idea it's like oh, well everybody else is searching that i wonder what that is mm. um, marcus did demonstrate um some of the marcus is one of the developers he did demonstrate algolia and the data that algolia collects around searching and one of the items it collect or data one of the pieces of data it collects is search terms that aren't bringing back any information so for example this wouldn't wouldn't be an, an actual physical example but for example if you did search under ballet and it's not bringing any information back then as the people who are looking after the site is that a tag you need to be adding to your collection if or for example if somebody's searching under basketball and it's not bringing any information back but you know you've got you know, photographs of people playing basketball. Yeah. Is that a is that a tag you need? To, and it's really interesting. And Algolia collects quite a lot of, of data around that. And uh, Gavin would probably know more about it than I do. Well, I, I think here the the, the steer or um, compass direction I give to coders is 
when your code is producing data, find every possible way you can of making it visible to the um, the users who care about that. You know, and um, web logs and, and search results are one thing that I'm just constantly amazed by that we don't look at enough, right? Because that's that's the reality of what people are, are doing with our online stuff. We might look at click-through maps on Google Analytics. That's kind of interesting, but people don't, not many people know what to do with it. And certainly small organizations absolutely forget it. You know, if you, if you just had one, like a, a URL that just had top search terms that didn't have a password on it because they'll forget the password, but was like a bookmark and isn't shared with anybody else if they want to do that to start with. That to me is like a, a, an MVP. Um, and, and if you're producing data that nobody is looking at, don't produce it. <laughs> That's the other thing. Save yourself I, the I, dev effort. Yeah, I wanted to share one more like small thing that I needed to think about. It's a, it's a museum, it's called Peak and Poke and it's in Croatia and it's in Rijeka in Croatia and they have everything. So they just collect random stuff. It's a private museum that is connected to toys and computers. So they have a ancient toy section and they have an ancient computer section, but they have like old plotters. Uh, you can use diskettes. They have all types of computer games. And the funny thing about it is they collect the hardware, they collect the games and you can use everything. So one third of everything is always broken but they fix it themselves over and over again. And it's really amazing that you can go there and play with everything that you want. And you see people so excited about like reliving their past and playing like Duke Nukem, um, one of those really old, old computers. <laughs> they just love it, love it, love it. And it's one of the most amusing museums I've ever been in my life. And they, they do a bunch of, the, they do cell phones, they do like, um, a bunch of digital art as well and it's it's really really a great museum uh, and they just every summer they drive around europe getting old computers from like governmental agencies that, and stuff i think it's, uh, that that last bit there you just mentioned is really important so they they don't wait for people to come to them they drive around europe and, and i think that's maybe something i'll, I'll just end uh, the, the session today on because i can see people are starting to to leave the worst thing as a developer is for nobody to use what you've made. True. Right. So the question, the challenge question I'd ask everyone is whatever it is you're making, why wouldn't you make it open? You, know, um, you might have a reason for that, in which case, fine. Right? But start with open. Uh, and my, my experience over um, all of the work that I've been doing is the more open that I make something, the more successful it tends to be. So that, that's that's maybe a good closing call to action. Thank you so much, Gavin and Lorraine, for being here with us. Um, I guess people will start to lead. Everybody that wants to hang out a little longer is welcome to do so. Um, the it's the recording is going to be available on the website. Um, as soon as we put it on there, 